Um, so today we're going to be going over SEO audits. So SEO auditing is a super valuable skill. You can, um, it, it is very, it's a very unique skill. So I think we've said this before, nine times out of 10, people who give you an SEO audit are literally plugging your URL into a tool and generating an audit. Okay. That is not what we're talking about. So if you had time to review any of the tools or uh, the SOP, the standard operating protocol that I shared, uh, we have a very meticulous process. And even that is very general compared to what actually gets accomplished. Um, so I think Ross is probably the only one who's been on a call with Megan, our, da our data scientist, doing an SEO audit. And she's like a mad scientist. Um, is that an apt description? <laughs> it goes fast. Yeah. And deep. Yeah, it's, it's a lot. <laughs> It's like a, it's a tire hose, basically. Yeah. So people who are really familiar with all the tools and really familiar with all the numbers can do this pretty efficiently, maybe in like three or four hours. Um, if you're new at it, it will probably take you closer to eight or 10 hours to do like a full SEO audit of a website because you're you're auditing all three components of SEO, on page, off page, and technical, right? And which I want to kind of talk through the SOP and then we'll look at an audit. Um, you'll see, and I want to show you like a couple different versions of audits that basically like went different directions. So you can start to see like as the human doing this process, you'll start to see the right like rabbit trails, rabbit holes, whatever. You'll start to see the right like things to chase because they're every single website is different. Every single website has different issues, different flaws, fundamental problems, reasons it's underperforming. Um, and you can't say by looking at a surface level what those are. So it's part of the reason like we don't sell SEO products without an SEO audit, because like I can't recommend things accurately to somebody if I don't know the big picture of their site performance. I don't know what to expect. Um, it's also why like you can't hire somebody to do SEO for you and then have them give you a report the first month that means anything. Like Ashley and I were actually talking about this earlier today, like the idea that like numbers need context, like without context, these numbers don't mean anything. They're just numbers and they can seem really, I mean, we talked about this way back when we were doing Google search console and Google analytics, right? Like you can pull numbers that may seem really good and they're really bad. You can pull numbers that may seem really bad and they're not actually bad in terms of the business. So it's just remembering all that context setting, what you as a human can bring to it in your um, analytical thinking. So We'll use a lot of tools. I'll blow through a lot of information. But at this point, I trust that because of what we've gone over, you guys have enough foundational knowledge that I'm not going to need to kind of simplify it too much. So I'm pretty much going to explain it to you like I would explain it to an SEO analyst of like, here's the process of how we pull information. And then um, and then we'll, you guys feel free to ask questions. Obviously, you can always like interrupt me and stuff. Okay. So this is our SOP for SEO audits. Um, obviously before you even begin, you have to validate that you have the right access at the minimum. You have to have Google search console and Google analytics access. You cannot get the right information without it. So if a client ever hires you to do an SEO audit and they're like, yeah, but we can't really give you access to our website or to any of our digital properties. You can be like, well, then I can't help you like, because we won't see it. It's like asking you to like diagnose an engine problem, but they don't let you pop the hood. Like, I mean, sure. I can make a lot of guesses, but um, all right. And then we basically create, we have two templates that we use and duplicate for every single SEO audit. The first is the SEO audit template, which is the deck itself. Okay. So like Sanders saw when we did an SEO report together yesterday or the day before, it's like just a lot of screenshotting, <laughs> like screenshot, copy over, screenshot, copy over. Um, but basically we know what categories we always want to show every client. This is a template in the sense that it gets duplicated for every single SEO audit and based on what a client, based on what the auditor wants to chase, what themes they're seeing and stuff, we'll end up building out one section of this like a lot and then other sections we just kind of skim over because it's like, okay, that's fine. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility in all of these tools and models, but um, the, the, like, the bones are there so that people have some framework to begin with. And then we always have an audit data template. So if you remember, um, when you export data from Google Search Console, you can create a Google Sheet, right? And it'll create, you export the data, it'll pull a Google Sheet up for you, whatever. We like to centralize all of the data here because not all of 
the information that you are collecting will be from Google Search Console, although some of it will be. But like, for instance, this is in SEMrush, right? The on-page SEO recommendation list that we would put. So because there's multiple sources, it makes more sense to create a centralized repository for all the data that you're collecting in the course of the audit. And then, you know, in the interest of being really transparent with clients, we're, we always make sure that we link to source data, right? We don't ever want them to be guessing about like where that data came from, because I mean, best case scenario, they feel equipped to do this themselves once a year if they want to, right? Or to have internal team members do it. So just making sure we bring as much like transparency to the process as possible. So they feel equipped to like, we know exactly where all of this came from. And we know, you know, you can find it yourself if you want. Right. So we don't ever want to like hide behind the process and be like, we're the experts. You can't touch this because the more people know, the more they believe in what we do because they can see the, pro the you know proof is in the pudding. Um, core web vitals obviously come from Google search console. And then because of the nature of our business at hire writer, obviously we always want to generate content ideas. So recommendations for like, based on the findings of this, because the problem is you don't want to end up having done a, a 10 hour and build a 10 hour SEO audit and then them be like, great, this is a lot of great information. Now what, right? Like the idea is that every single, every single thing you uncover should be accompanied by a recommendation and how to implement a fix. So like, don't tell them you need to go change. I'm going off on a rabbit trail, but I'll say it. Don't tell them you need to go you know, change all of your images. You need to go compress all the images of your website without telling them how to do tiny PNGs or how to implement a WordPress plugin that compresses the images. Like we don't ever want them to feel like we just offered you a whole bunch of really intense, complex knowledge. And now you're totally overwhelmed and you have no idea how to implement it. Um, so I'm really careful about that. And, and, the, and the last thing I'll say before we go into it itself, the last thing I've started doing is I will like link out to articles, even ones that aren't ours, um, so that they understand the terminology because the problem is like, I mean, you've done this, we've been hanging for like what, four weeks or six weeks or something. The amount of acronyms that you know, now know, <laughs> And you don't realize that other people don't know what you're talking about, right? So it's like we've been talking about a community group with, you know, communication. Like you have to like pay attention to whether or not you're like, people are glassed over and they're like, yeah, I lost you three slides ago. I have no idea what any of this means, you know, whatever. Um, the goal is not to like wave your superior knowledge. The goal is to educate them as much as possible and like really democratize this knowledge. Because the reason people get taken advantage of by SEO companies is that they don't know what they, they don't know what they're talking about, Right. They don't know what those people are talking about. And they assume, okay, this is a critical issue on my website. Sure, I got to pay you to fix it. So it's very, very important that you kind of use this tool to educate the client. And when I present it to them, I go real slow. Like I always send it to them in advance. And then if I need two hours, I will take two hours to go through it and just make sure we're really clear and really um, coherent as we kind of get through it with them. Any questions about that? That's kind of just like the ethos behind this, right? Like this is an ethical thing as is everything we do. Um, okay. That's that. That's for my team, not you. Okay. So the first thing we do is create the folder deck and spreadsheet. I pretty much always do that for you guys. Cause I don't want you to have to stress about where stuff originates and whatever. Um, and then obviously we have naming conventions because it's me and I'm incredibly picky about that. Um, Google sheet. Yeah. So I just, you know, standardize the naming again, that's an SOP best practice. And then they, and then basically I tell them, okay, open a doc and a deck. So open the two things. And I want you to always have a Google doc running on the side as well, so that you can write down things you notice. Cause not everything you notice will go right in the report, but I tell my auditors, like go from this SOP directly to the deck. Like as you get data, plug it in. Cause otherwise you're just going to take data, put it somewhere and then take it out again and put it in the deck. And that's a wasted step. So don't waste time doing that. Put it right in the deck, but you're going to want to take notes too. So just make sure you've got a place to do that. And then it's run the numbers. So the very first thing you do, obviously, is log in everywhere. Look at everything. So you would pull up GSC, you pull up GA, you pull up their website, their CMS, their anything else you got access to, like pull it all up and look at it, right? And like we've talked about so much, a lot of this is just like anomaly detection. Like what looks wrong? What, what of this doesn't match? What of this looks out of place? Why was there a blip? And just like begin to type out everything that you notice. So a lot of being an auditor, right, is just being a good noticer. So just notice all the things that you can take notes about it. Um, pull the site map. So there's lots of ways, you know, to find site maps. It's usually just an XML file on their site, but you want to like go through that too. 
right? Because they're well, so let's 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 take a break from me monologuing here for a second. So as you do this very initial research, you pull up a site map. What are you looking for in a site map? Why do you care? I have no idea. Good. <laughs> I guess that makes me a useful person in the conversation. <laughs> Does anybody know what you would look for in a site map? No, oh, I did the post. Um, would it have anything to do with like URL structure? It has everything to do with that. Good job. Yeah. So the first thing you want to look at is last modified. And you want to be like, make sure that the year you're in is represented in that last modified. Because it could be, right? We just did this with a client where she only logged into their website and we had gotten hired for an SEO audit. And we were like, girlfriend, you don't need an SEO audit. You just haven't submitted your sitemap to Google. <laughs> so we're like, let's do that. We'll talk in a month and see what happens, right? Um, so just check, make sure that the sitemap is current and it's running, okay? And then exactly what Sandra said. You're gonna look for, does this map, First of all, is this map banana pants long? Like, do they have a six page website and they have eight, 800 URLs, right? Are there any like big functional problems? Because SEO cannot fix, right? On page SEO, off page SEO, technically, like, it, it can't fix certain issues. So you need to know if those issues exist, like there are broken problems. They had an old website on WordPress and they improperly migrated it to HubSpot. You would see that in URL structure problems, right? Um, what you can do is you can go in here and compare this to the data you see in Google Search Console. So like if I pulled up this client in Google Search Console, what should I look for? Oh, shit. I did the wrong thing. I should look for page count. So this is, so there are two sitemaps, if you noticed. There's page and post. So that one had what, 40, 41? And then let's load post. Okay. So does the number match, right? Does the number of pages in the sitemap match the pages that are being indexed by Google? If that number is super off, there's, there's a fundamental problem that no amount of like blogging is going to fix. So you just kind of do all that analysis of like, does the sitemap make sense to me? Does the way they've structured it make sense to me? What you won't see on a sitemap is subdomains. Okay. A lot of big businesses do this. So like they'll have location pages as like subdomains. They'll have, they'll have all kinds of URL wonky URL structure. So if you log in and look at a sitemap and they're like, yeah, we have 8,000 web pages. And you're like, mm, no, you don't, you have 800. Well, are they on subdomains? Cause your entire audit will be off. If you only edit, if you only audit or analyze a root domain and like, it's like an iceberg, right? Like they've got all these like subdomains within their ecosystem that then you didn't know to audit or, you know, they didn't submit to you. Um, they could have a lot of redirect URLs to other sites, things like that. So you're just kind of like doing that diagnostic to begin with and be like, how does this website, does this website make sense to me? Does the way it's set up make sense? Does the way it's communicating with Google make sense? Like it does everything, is everything clicking? And you kind of look again, you're just noticing what, what can you notice? Any questions about that? Okay. So then what you're going to do is, and this is like the manual part that everybody hates me for, but I'm like, if you're a good auditor, you're not going to leave a stone unturned. So go through, click every single page in the nav, skim all the content, right click and inspect the code. You guys know how to do that? So if you go to a website and you want to know what's wrong with it, how it's set up, how, how the coding works. This was a fantastic blog, by the way, if you haven't read it yet. So you're going to right click, inspect and that's gonna pull up the code, okay? So you're looking, are there headers, right? Just skim, you don't have to do this on every single page, but just like basically skim. Um, do they have a bunch of plugins, right? Cause you're gonna look in a minute and look for um, site speed and you wanna begin to gain some understanding of how the site is performing just as a user, okay? Cause the problem is like, if you jump to analysis using tools and stuff, you've taken the human component out of it because a tool might say, 
this is the problem, but you might say, right. But as a human, like the problem is I can't find that button or the problem is the pop-up won't get out of the way. Or the problem is when I minimize it, the chat bot notification goes over the checkout button. Like as a human, you'll notice things that the tool can't pick up. Right. So you, it's important that you just get on the site and you, you look at it, you click through all the navigation components and you look and you see like, does this make sense? Is this, you know, is this logical and basics and is it easy to use? Right. And then you just clicking away on your Google doc, taking your notes. Right. Like, this is weird. I don't like that. This doesn't work in mobile, blah, blah, blah. All right. And then you're obviously going to start Googling them. So this is where you, again, it's a very manual process, but I think it's worth doing and I'm not, my location is not turned off. So obviously the results of this will be skewed, but if you Google the URL, hold on. Here we go. All right. If you Google hire, if you Google the company name, do they come up? That's not us. Maybe we don't because our site was not indexed. Turned out, <laughs> it turns out. Oh wait, no, that is us. Okay, we're we're number one. Um, it was just our blog that wasn't indexed. Um, are they coming up for stuff that makes sense? Right, you start looking, and so why do you have to do this manually? Who cares? Can't you just run it through SEMrush? You want to start building fluency about who else is with them in SERP, search engine results page. You want as a human. What other businesses are with them, like a cohort in the search engine results page? Yes, you can do a competitive analysis. It's going to tell you a lot about URLs and keywords. But as a human searching for something relevant to that business, what other businesses are popping up? Okay. If a client has ordered specifically like battle card development or a, a really like robust competitive analysis, you linger on this phase a bunch because you want to collect the top 25 people, entities in that cohort with them? Who else, Who are they actually up against, right? Um, again, you can use SEMrush to do that, but as a human, you're going to, what What do you see when I Google it? What do I see that I won't see if I run a competitive analysis in SEMrush? Ads for one thing. see feature snippets, you see, uh, you, know, you know, other types of, if there's any like knowledge graph results, images, videos, all that kind of, a much more rich view than just looking at through sem Russian, just getting a, a pool of data on a spreadsheet. Yeah. You see the questions people also ask. So if you've Googled a brand name, now our brand name is a little weird, but if you've Googled a brand name, you're going to see keywords that are linguistically related, right? And you're also going to see all the meta descriptions. I can look at a meta description and tell you whether or not somebody has an SEO strategy, right? So you, you build that fluency. And to, to Ross's point, the view is much richer when you're doing it manually. So it's obnoxious and it takes a lot of time. And it's why SEO audits can take up to 10 hours because you're not just exporting a report, right? You're educating yourself as the auditor, building all of these little pieces of knowledge that you'll need to make an actual thoughtful, meaningful recommendation that takes as much as possible into account. So you'll Google them related keywords. You're going to run any site tests that you think are relevant. So you may do Screaming Frog. You may do Lighthouse reports if you know code. Um, you may just do speed, right? So, I mean, we, I make people do this for, I mean, Megan gets annoyed with me, but at least the like, so site speed.dev, right? I make her go through and take the URL of the top, every page in the nav usually. And then you go through here and you're going to diagnose all your performance issues. It's going to be a little scary. Don't tell Shaley we're doing this to her scary amount of that. So what this is doing, so this is a tool, PageSpeed Insights is a Google tool, and it's going to basically tell you how your site's performing on mobile and desktop. Ooh. A lot of times you will have sites that perform really well on desktop and really poorly on mobile. And they'll be, and this is almost always the sites who are like, we just got our site redesigned by a professional agency. And then you look at the mobile speed and you're like, mm, that's a problem, right? Um, are people going to wait? No, 
It's because our images are not in next gen formats because I keep changing my mind about what photos I want on the website. That's not Shaley's fault. <laughs> um, I, we got a little too much Java. We've got render blocking resources. So I would strongly suggest whatever website you have access to that you care about, um, that you go through and look at this, just run it. It's free, right? Just run the URL through this checker and then look and what you, this just reading what all these are is going to build a huge amount of SEO knowledge for you. This is technical SEO, right? This is site health. You're not going to see this level of data on Google search console, which is where you would go to find basic site health stuff. So we actually go through and we take screenshots. Um, I told you it's like screenshot o'clock. Um, in our SEO audit reports, but basically like take a screenshot of this and then we save them all in a folder. Um, that's part of that client's audit folder. So they have the screenshots because in addition, right, you want to tell them obviously baseline, here's where you're at. You also want to be able to tell them six months later after they've hired you in an SEO engagement, hey, your core web vitals are up X percent. Here's a screenshot from when we ran your audit before. And here's a screenshot. You're at 83. You're 43 then. You're at 83 now, right? Like having that reference point is really helpful. And as many digital, you know, as many dashboards as we can build, some sometimes like having static records is really, really helpful because you can go back and reference them. Um, and this is very eye-catching, right? So we're good on everything except performance, and that's my fault. Okay. So that's, that, those are some of the site tests. Obviously, if you're more of a developer, you know, um, Megan sometimes will set up like custom code elements or, you know, different things to be able to automate some of the data that she's about to collect, but that's a level of sophistication that I personally do not possess. So then what we do is we create a SEMrush project. So if you remember, you go in SEMrush, create the project, and then you run the site audit, read it. It's long. Look at it. Make sure what it found matches what you found. Most of the activities I just walked you through are things that the SEMrush audit is going to pull up in some form or fashion. Problem is the audit basically does no analysis and all recommendations now. It didn't used to be that way. Like it used to be a lot more analysis. Now it really does very little analysis and it's all in tech jargon. So handing it again, handing it to a client is so unloving because it's like, they don't know what it means and they can't do anything with it. So it, it's useful. You've got a couple times in the report that we will link to it to help people understand kind of what it found because it is useful and it's good data, but um, look at it, read it. And then we run the on-page SEO checker. So this is where, because of the nature of obviously how we then seek to win engagements, there will be a lot of content recommendations that come as a result of our SEO audit. So it's important to have kind of the on-page checker because that's what's going to tell you like, hey, you have 23 duplicate meta descriptions and stuff like that, that manually sourcing would be really excruciating. So it's going to automate all that, right? It'll be like you're, you have 83 matching title tags or blah, 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 or like none of these pages have H1s, like stuff that it would be very arduous for you to source on your own, but it can run and easily find. And then you would review, obviously go back to Google search console, go back to Google analytics and review all of those. What you find when you go through all of those processes I just explained, form like the heart of the report. Um, as you can imagine, we could have spent an hour in each one of those tasks, right? And probably would if it was a real SEO report so that we're touching everything. Like we don't, again, we don't leave any stone unturned. We don't want to not interact with any portion of the website. Um, as you can imagine, when you're running an SEO audit, it's very easy to do a little bit of UX, right? You're gonna comment on buttons that don't work, hamburger menus that are weird. There's an interplay in a lot of these disciplines between SEO and user experience, UX, right? There's interplay between um, SEO and competitive intelligence, as we already saw, right? Like you're gonna start laying some competitive field work. Um, so don't shy away from that. I know a lot of SEO purists who are like, no, 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 I don't care about any of that. This is just an SEO audit, but again, to be loving towards the client, it would be helpful to give them the most complete picture possible. Um, at Winding River, we've developed like digital audits. So we include like MarTech stack analysis and uh, social media audits and things like that. But so you don't have to go like down that path, especially if you're not being compensated for it. You have to be reasonable. But as much as you notice, write down. 
and then you can give the client as full a picture as possible. Because if they can make an SEO decision that makes sense for their business, it's going to be much more holistically helpful for them, what you provide, as opposed to just like, you should blog more. Obviously, if that's the takeaway, then you've done a bad job. Okay. Um, then you begin the report, obviously on here, like we match the number of the slides to the number of the blah, blah, blah. Uh, let me see. I just give examples and then we'll look at the actual thing. Yeah. Site health, indexing, user behavior on the site, site queries, content overview. Okay. It's quite long. Any questions about the direction or anything like that? And then we'll look through an actual audit. I apologize this isn't more interactive, but I'm not quite sure how to make it. I do have a question. When you're doing a full audit like this, yeah, I know you said it's like anywhere between like four and 10 hours. What does that look like? Is that over a week you're putting that time? Is that a dedicated one day? Like how, what does this look like in real life? Yeah, it totally depends. Um, I am like a sit down and do it in one session kind of person. So mm -hmm. I will typically do it like on a weekend. Um, especially if I know it's going to be closer to a 10 hour audit and just block the time. Um, I know Jason will do it like overnight. <laughs> he like, will just like stay up really late and then do it like through the whole, um, oh, wow. night just cause he works. He's a night owl. Uh, Megan will break it up over the course of like three or four days. Usually I find it really hard to step away cause I lose the thread. Mm. Mm. And I'm like, ah, I saw something there, but I can't remember. And it, this is. <laughs> brain work. Like I can't, this is like no noise, no talking, no notifications, no cat, no kids. Like I gotta be like, no cause you have, you, you're looking for the little stuff and that's a lot. So yeah, it kind of depends. It's not like fun. <laughs> but... I guess it depends on who you ask, right? Yeah. <laughs> It's not excruciating either. It's more, honestly, it's more excruciating now that we have this probably for them because it's like constraints, <laughs> but I'm also like, we got to have a system. So, all right. So components of the audit itself, screenshots, data, narrative, super important, right? Um, I always, I, I want as much narrative as possible on a deck, as long as it's readable. And then I add overflow narrative to the comment section. So I would really never send this to a client. I will present this to a client and then we will, I'll send it to them after the presentation because like, they're not going to understand it. Um, and if they have anybody on their team who's done SEO, they're going to disagree with it because there will invariably, no matter how kind you are, there will, there will invariably be things in here that tell them your SEO person has not done a great job, right? Like they wouldn't be hiring us if it was like knocked out of the park. We have competent people we trust. Um, they're, they, people only order an audit if they suspect that something could be wrong or something could be better. So they're going to be, you're going to be critical, right? You have to be, and it's your job to be like, don't soften the blow, tell the, tell the truth. Uh, Cause they can't fix what they don't understand is wrong. Um, so we always do a report summary. That's just like a manifest of like, here are the big ideas. So right away, you can tell keeping good notes and then going over those notes before you assemble the narrative is really helpful because you won't by hour eight, you're not going to remember what you noticed in hour one, right? So it's really, really important that you like, again, even if it's just shorthand, whatever in your own, um, I type it. I mean, I guess you could write it, but keep that because those are the big ideas, right? So the big themes on this page, on this website were that there are critical performance issues. And this was a brand new website, by the way. And it was heartbreaking what we found. Okay. Critical performance issues. The user behavior on the site is somehow great, but the site is ranking not high enough to support visibility in SERP first priority, and then two additional components, right? So you can think about, I mean, use your marketing brain when you're assembling these, as you're presenting it to somebody, like think about what they need to know first, because attention will be high. And then where are we at? Minute 32. In the next 15 minutes, most of you will have most mostly not be listening to me. <laughs> and then by like minute, you know, two minutes till you'll be like, are we done yet? Is she gonna, is she gonna wrap up? Is she gonna ask us? Yeah. So it's just human nature, right? Your attention drops off. And we present this in it's at least an hour, right? Usually to present and talk through. So make sure you cover anything imperative in the first slide. 
because people will stop paying attention. All right, so we do a domain overview. Um, increasingly, we've started doing things like this where we go back. And this is kind of like what Ashley and I said, Ashley and I were talking about earlier today, it was like context, right? So your domain authority is a 36 or this client, your domain authority is a 16. So is that good? Is that bad? Like with, <laughs> there's no context for that. Um, not only do we not know if it's good or bad, we don't know if it's changed, right? We don't know, you know, we don't know what it means and we don't know if it's gotten better or worse. So we've, we've started doing a lot of these kind of like panels where we put different scores. Um, another thing I will mention to you is that a huge problem when you're running an audit could be Google search console or Google analytics wasn't put in the site until recently. And it does not collect data until it is installed. That code snippet is installed on the website. So if you, you might hit a roadblock in some of your data collection. If you find that a site didn't have it installed, it was quite, you know, a, quite a long time ago. Um, I mean, it wasn't a long time ago. It was recent then you're going to miss all that historical data, which is why we have a tool like SEMrush, right? So we can actually go in and we can find data. It's not, again, first party data, but it's as best as we can. And then I'll often explain, like, why am I showing this? Um, especially like, so like often Megan or Jason will create reports for us and then I'll present them to the client. So it's helpful for me sometimes for them to like explain what they were thinking because they might not be the ones actually presenting it to the client. Um all right, and then site performance report. So this is exactly what I said. Um, I, we took screenshots of how their performance is. I mean, this was a brand new site performing. Their homepage was performing at a 20 on mobile. And that's when you just have to be like, I don't want to like dog people. I don't want to be that agency that comes in and is like your previous agency sucked. But at the same time, I have to tell you the truth. Your web developers didn't understand SEO, right? So what are our options, right? Um, so yeah. So I have directions for the people and then we will link. So throughout, I have poorly spaced, apparently buttons um, that link out to data. So I want them to be able to, the idea is this, I can present this to them. And then I want them to be able to go back through it and verify and validate all of my work if they want to, right? To be able to look and see, this is where the data come from came from. Then this is the conclusion that she drew because of it. And I want them to be able to look at the data and then be able to kind of match my conclusion. So you can see how we went through and took all these screenshots of the core pages on the website, and then they can access through that button. So we just want to be very helpful and very kind at every stage. And then who can tell me where this is from? Do you recognize the graphic? So this is a SEMrush screenshot. So basically it tells us, here's the crawled pages, here's the site health, errors, warnings, notices. So this is a screenshot taken from the SEMrush SEO audit. And like I said, we will run the audit and then we will provide the audit to the client. I don't know that anybody would ever go through this. Um, I do not white label these because I want to be very transparent about the fact that like, we didn't put this together for you. This was automated. It took 10 minutes. Like... <laughs> We're not going to charge you for it, you know, whatever. Um, so we leave all the branding on. It's an option in some rush to not brand, but you'll see all the um, all the things, right? You care most about errors. You care less about warnings. You don't really care about notices. So just to kind of explain and decode that to a client so that when they thumb through, they're not like stressing out about something that's a really low priority. Because again, like the idea of the outcome of this is prioritize recommendations. It's like, here are our recommendations, here's what's most important, and then here are the next two things that are important. Because they're immediately going to have to have discussions about who to hire to fix this stuff, how long it's going to take. And the last thing in the world you want is to offer all these development recommendations and then have them go hire a developer who gives them an outlandish quote for execution. So the more you can like arm them with the knowledge of like, here's what needs to be fixed and here's about how long it should take to fix it, whether or not they hire you to do it, it's a really helpful and kind way to kind of make sure they're educated about expect and have the right expectations. Maybe developers don't like me for doing that, but it's the right thing to do. Okay, search health indexing. So this is where we would link out to the audit data so that they can see. Um, and what we did here, so that's the content. I switched the order of it, sorry, because we are actually active with this client. Um, all the audit data is here. So the site index data is here. So who remembers where that would come from? 
Well, it's Google Search Console. Good job. Yep. So that's from Google Search Console. And then we've got all the site keywords, same source, right? Google Search Console. So this is just basically telling them, hey, here's all the keywords you currently rank for. Here's the pages. Does anybody recognize this spreadsheet? So this is the spreadsheet we export exported directly from Google Search Console. So we're still using that, but we're linking it in our own spreadsheet so that we have a repository of all of these different data sets from all of these different sources. Okay. So it just makes things really clean for the client. So they only have one place to look and they know exactly what they're looking at and what it means. Um, okay. So that was that. So that's just search health index. So we'll talk more broadly about site health, um, they often do not understand anything about indexing. So it's really helpful to pull up Google Search Console and show them any of this in real time. If you sense that they have the attention and are willing to learn, then yeah, pulling up the tool in real time and being like, here, let me show this to you. This is obviously a different site and client, but you know, and then walk them through this stuff. Now that you know what all this means, right? You can walk them through it and be like, okay, this isn't a big deal. No index tag. We don't want that to index, right? But this might be a big deal, right? A server error, a uh, crawl to currently not indexed, and you can explain to them what all of that means. So that's helpful. All right. And then we do user behavior on site. So where does this come from? Search console. Other one. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. Google Analytics. So user behavior, so remember site health keywords will be Google Search Console, user behavior will be Google Analytics. So then we just go, we make these tables to basically pull out the most important data. Now, could you just, not really, you can't really export data now. We could just do a bunch of screenshots, but we know what the most important data points are. And again, that's where you like, you're taking like this vast body of data and distilling it down to say like, as a business owner of this website, here's what you care about, right? And you're just like educating them on here's here's what you care about and is this good? So the is this good question, <clears throat> it would be visually exhausting to present everything with that much context, okay? So it is important as you do all of that initial discovery to be collecting norms, okay? So if you did a competitive analysis and you pulled up 20 sites that that client's competing for, you need to pull up the average domain authority, like run all of those sites through some kind of checker. What are they, how many keywords are they ranking for, right? So if all of their competitors are ranking for 800 keywords, they might be like, we should rank for more than 800 keywords. But you could say kind of norms in your industry and against your competitors is 800 keywords. So maybe not a bad thing, right? Now, often clients will have wildly unrealistic goals and be like, but we want to rank for 50,000 keywords. And you're like, sure, 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 sure. Like, let's give it a decade. Um, you know, so I think it's just important to set context and you memorize the context so that when you get in this live conversation with them and they're barraging you with these questions of like, well, is that good or bad? You have an answer. And by the time you've done five of these, you'll be like, you'll just know, right? Like you'll know in real estate, this kind of is the vibe. In law, in law this is kind of the vibe. In manufacturing, like you'll kind of build a lexicon of understanding of like the terms of play for SEO for different industries which makes you really powerful because then you can start to compare in your head and think, yeah, for law, that would be great. But for this, it's that. And it gives you this really like high level, broad, rich understanding so that you can kind of survey websites and have a lot of educated guesses before you even pop the hood. I'm going off on a tangent again. Okay. Then we do site queries, obviously, like with this, we're just like lots of opportunity. You know me, I like to soften everything with an emoji. So I just, you know, list like, what do they have in these different positions? You remember pages are no more. So this is especially important. Um, other things you're going to want to compare, obviously, as you start looking at some of this data visualization in these various tools is the, the major anomalies, because then you want to go back the year before what happened, what happened, what happened. Ashley and I were talking about that today too. Does your website crash every March, right? Does your traffic just go to garbage, right? Does it spike again in November? Like, is that normal? Because setting the expectation of somebody about their website performance in a like seasonality or cyclical sense is really, really helpful for you as an SEO provider, because then it's like, 
yeah, when November hits and your numbers tank, you're not pointing a finger at me because I, I not only told you about this then, I've kept it in front of you every month. Okay, we know November is going to dip year over year. That's the trend. Let's see if it dips less this year, right? Like you just start to like build an understanding of not just how the website performs in a given snapshot of time, but over a much broader length of time. And that's where your kind of relationship with them becomes really valuable. Because then you know, like, okay, we need to hedge against this November slump by blogging a bunch in June and July so that those things hit the index so that we get an organic bump by November. Like, you can build this, like, annual strategy that addresses some of those challenges. But you can't if you don't know what they are, right? And they won't invest in it if they don't know why you're recommending it. Be like, I know this is going to fall off. It could hurt our business. Let's hedge against it by doing this. We did that last this last year with Air Oasis, we did all of their Black Friday. It's an e-commerce air purification brand. We did all of their like Black Friday and holiday, like shopping list blogs and all that stuff. But we posted them all by like September and they were like, this is crazy. It blew every other year out of the water because we were indexed and searchable way before their competitors were. Um, it's, you know, from a user experience, maybe it seemed a little weird, but e com and organic can be such a powerful combination, it was worth doing. So you can't make those recommendations if you don't see it. You can't establish the kind of seasonal norms and expectations if you don't track them. Um, queries driving. So again, you're just going to look and see, okay, this isn't a normal report, right? What, what's driving site traffic? You're beginning to set their understanding. And if they see stuff in here that they're like, that doesn't make sense to me, you're like, good, it shouldn't. Why is it on your website, right? Or you can have those conversations. So like for this one, they're ranking for a bunch of Spanish keywords. So we had kind of a long conversation about that. Um, so this is where you as the analyst are building the right tangents and segues. And it's why you have to complete the whole thing yourself and then consider where am I going to linger? Because you can't linger everywhere. Like we're at 545 and we are not even actually going through the report, right? It's important that you think about how you're budgeting your time for that full hour. And if they start asking, getting down a rabbit hole of what indexing is right here, and you know, like, hey, we need to have a really strong conversation about bilingual SEO right here, you need to cut it off, right? And move the conversation along because you know that more important business things are coming. So it's just one of those like presentation skills, I guess, um, important to kind of learn. All right, top URLs, obviously that's Google Search Console, and then the on-page recommendations. So as you saw on the site audit data sheet, we do, we download, like we'll put all the ones from SEMrush, and then we'll typically, like I'll have Shaoli or one of like, like Shaoli's our developer, I'll have her go through and look at them and tell me like, which of these actually matter? And then which of these would you put on a punch list? And then if I know this client's likely to need development assistance, like if they don't have a developer, then what I'll do is say to Shaoli, like in advance of this report, like, can you give me a quote for how many hours it would take to fix all these problems? So then I could come to them and be ready and say like, hey, if you want us to help you, we can. It would take about like, I think for the last one she did, it was like 44 hours <laughs> to fix all of their problems. And it really helps to have a developer you trust because I don't know if that's good or bad or right or wrong, right? I just know that's what she told me, but I trust her. Um, and then we can say, hey, we can help you with development. It would be about this many hours. If you want to offer this exact information to another developer to shop that, feel free. Like get estimates from multiple people, right? But so we have like kind of pre, like we set up that information so that we're able to kind of have the most helpful conversation um, for implementation that we can. User acquisition, where does this come from? <laughs> Nobody wants to answer that. Analytics. Thank you, thank you. I realize these are repetitive, but uh, the more times you hear it, the more you'll remember it. Um, again, this is without context, who cares, who knows, right? So you need to have in your back pocket an understanding. And if you did a competitive analysis, you ran those competitor sites through some kind of checker, you need to know like, what's the average bounce rate for this industry? Ecom industries could have 90% plus bounce rates and that's normal, right? Super informational professional services, maybe 30%. So you need to know what, what's good, right? What's bad? Cause they might look at that and be like 50% of the people who come to our website leave, right? And be like, duh, 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 duh. So you have to be able to one to like bracket that conversation and put it in context, which is really, really helpful because yeah, these bounce rates are great, um, but they don't, you know, 
unless they're SEO people, they don't know that. Competitive landscape. So again, there may be clients for whom you're doing an actual like battle court battle cards and you've got like a really in-depth competitive analysis that you're going to use because they want to like dominate that you're going to go off on a rabbit trail if you do that. And there's going to be like 10 slides in this section, right? That tell you like, here's the anatomy of our top six organic competitors and here's what it would take to beat them. Um, you're getting that adds an extra six hours to the audit easily. It's very complex, but worth doing if they have that as a goal. And that's where you, the discovery and the initial conversations that you have, like everyone's like, yeah, I need an SEO audit. It's like, okay, what do you want? What do you hope to achieve with organic search? Like if you ask a couple of thoughtful questions, either for somebody you work for or a client or something like that, it can help you steer the audit and spend your time wisely. Because the worst thing you can do is spend like four hours going on a keyword rabbit trail. And they're like, yeah, we don't want to make content this year. We're just interested in X, you know, and then you're like, well, I didn't really look into that. Um, so even with a good plan that covers all the bases, you have to customize your approach because you want to be able to give somebody something that's really, really useful and that matches their business goals. So like when we did this with, we'll, we'll tend to do this annually with a client. And like last year when we did it with tracks, like I sat them down. I don't know if Brianna's here. Brianna, are you here? Okay. Well, anyway, Brianna and I sat down and we're like, what are your, what are your business goals? Like where, what niches are you focusing on? What service lines, what regions are you developing in? Like that kind of thing. And, and she was like, she had really specific organic KPIs that she set for herself. So it's just important that you kind of align with what they want and, and make sure that you're developing that correctly. And then always end with like, okay, here's a punch list. You'll often not have time to review that. But what you can do is after the call, obviously you send and then say, here's the punch list of, of recommendations that include technical on page and then our content recommendations for you. And then let's not look at this one time in our lives and then never look at this again, because we know that websites are living, breathing. And we need to make sure we're monitoring all these things that we see. So that's pretty much it. Questions. What of this do you think is the most challenging part for you as you consider like all these different activities and tasks? What of this do you think is hard for you? And what do you think comes easy? Sitting down. <laughs> Fair. Staying still. <laughs> a very long and painful thing. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, I don't know that anything is like out of reach. I think everything is figure outable. Um, but it's a lot. I mean, it's, there's a lot of information there. And to be able to speak fluently to the concerns that someone might bring up, like as you're moving through the information, I mean, to understand it is one thing, but to be able to, you know, explain it in a way that makes sense is a whole nother challenge. Yeah. And you can plan for their questions to an extent, obviously, based on how observant you were or how observant you are with them and knowing who's going to be in that room. Um, but there's always going to be curveballs. They're going to ask you stuff. And you just have to be patient with yourself and be like, I don't have all the answers, but I'm happy to find that out for you. Don't just make it up. <laughs> Obviously, don't lie. That doesn't work. <laughs> no, don't lie. <laughs> just be like, I don't know, but I can Google it. 90% <laughs> of consulting. Okay, so what else do we think is hard about it? Patience, yeah, persevering, becoming fluent enough to handle questions. Yeah, I think I would agree with what Caitlin said. It's not like the individual component, there's nothing like mind bendingly hard there, right? It's all relatively straightforward and you know, you can just follow the framework and get it done. But you know, holding all those ideas in your head, like it. It feels like doing this must be like juggling like 10 or 15 balls at once and trying to like keep track of all those threads and know which ones to pull and when. So I think, you know, that's the kind of thing that you have to hone more through experience than through uh, 
you know, because every SEO audit's different, right? No, no two SEO audits are the same. So you just have to get out there and do them, I think. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. I think there's kind of the anomaly hunting, right? To know the ability to kind of see what's important. But I think knowing that you have a limited amount of billable hours creates pressure. And it's like, I have to know which things are worth pursuing, which ideas are worth pursuing. And the things that I know as an analyst, as an experienced analyst are most important, don't always match with what I know the client is going to care most about. And so it's like evaluating, like, how much do I pursue this thing that I think is their best bet at success, knowing they're not going to pay for that, you know, like, or, you know, how much do I pursue this like competitive analysis when I know that their website gets 500 hits a month and their closest competitor gets 20,000. Like you have no chance ever of competing based on what you've done so far on your website. Like, but they want a robust competitive analysis. Um, so yeah, it, it, it can be a delicate kind of balance of knowing which, what to pursue. So it's like teaching yourself what to notice, developing enough of an understanding of all these things that you can find something someone else wouldn't find. Cause that's the other thing. Like, I mean, for me, like the litmus test is always like, if another SEO analyst looked at this work, would I have found something that they're like, oh yeah, I wouldn't have noticed that. And that's just because I'm a performance mentality person. I don't know. Ross is probably the only person here who agrees. I can't remember. Oh, Caitlin, are you type eight? Um, but I'm, but I think it's an important gut check to be like, you know, is this truly useful to somebody? Not just tell like what you're not doing. I hope you noticed is ripping data from one section and putting it in a pitch deck. Like you are taking it all. And to Ross's point, you're holding it all at the same time. And you're looking at it and you're like, what matches? What doesn't match? What's the wrong size? What doesn't fit? What's not sustainable? Like what's broken? And, and then creating a full picture of like, here's where you're at. And then not just that, but then saying like the recommendation side of like, here's the full picture. And then here's what you should do. That's the consultant part, right? So I wouldn't actually expect like an SEO analyst to be able to say that because what you should do is very much like a business question, right? What you should do about it. Um, but we can say what you can do about it. Here's what you can do to fix this. You don't want to emerge from an SEO audit just telling them what exists. They can find that out. You want to say, here's what you can do. And then a consultant can take it over and say, here's what they should do, right? Based on the bigger picture of their business goals and all the things that they have in mind and KPIs and all that. And then making sure all the things you recommend they can do, they actually will do, and that they'll track <laughs> so that you can say in a year, I can run this audit again, and you've implemented all of my recommendations, and they've had the desired result. That's kind of the ultimate. They won't, but even if they do 50%, like, <laughs> then you're, you're in good shape, <laughs> usually. All right. Any other questions? Did, did you notice anything missing? Is there anything that we don't do that we should do? Um, Anything that you would do differently or that you've seen done differently? I mean, I know you guys all are exposed to a lot of different things and not all of you work for me. I do have a question. And it's more of a, why do you do it the way you do it? Rather than here's a better way to do it. <laughs> um, in your Excel sheet, can you pull it back up with mm -hmm. the, the audit? Um, Excel the audit sheet? data. Mm -hmm. Because on the that page, mm -hmm. why is it that you're sourcing out to another Excel sheet rather than just putting the site index data yeah. here? It's, it's a total like client learn. So um, they, most clients are not super familiar with Google Sheets and they don't understand how once tabs exceed the visible quantity for a oh. full screen view, they don't understand how to scroll to new tabs. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And I think there is a way to link in a Google sheet to a tab. Yeah. But I don't know what it is. Yeah. I have Googled that once. So I find out. Just tell me. I, well, <laughs> Megan did it for us, but then I was like, but they still miss it. Cause then they're trying to show a colleague 
the data we showed them and they're like it's not on this spreadsheet oh you and mean they, from like an entirely different sheet or within this doc like within, within this, this doc they'll be very yeah stressed. okay yeah yeah i'll see if i can find it i did i did figure yeah. that out once <laughs> they'll be like the data you showed us isn't there and then you have to like send them a screenshot of like here's a little arrow to, you know but that okay. makes them then, then you know anytime you set somebody up to be in a scenario where they feel unfamiliar, uncomfortable, or have to ask a question, it creates vulnerability. Sure, and yeah. when you're in, usually when you're delivering an SEO audit, you're still in the trust building phase of the relationship, which is the first six to eight weeks. And so you don't want to do anything that makes them feel vulnerable or like they don't know what they're doing because then it undermines trust or it makes them feel insecure. Makes sense. Okay. Thank you. It's my nice way of saying idiot proofing. <clears throat> I would never have thought of that. I honestly would just keep running tabs and like, good luck guys. Just scroll, find it. But that's a, uh, that's a really good point that yeah, maybe not the right answer. They don't understand. And then, and then they feel dumb or whatever. We don't want that. No, we want them to feel loved and cared for. And like, you're not dumb for not knowing this. It is complicated. I mean, we understand it, but how much training have we gone through in our lives? And then even the last six weeks, refamiliarizing ourselves so like it's, you always have, it is so, so, so helpful to continuously work with people who don't understand what you do because it forces you to be humble and to explain things when you don't think you should have to, and to do it in a non-patronizing way so that they know, like, you're really good at this. I'm really good at this. And my goal here is not to just swing my knowledge. My goal here is to make this communicable. At the end of the day, if you do this so that you can like show how impressive all of your SEO knowledge is, you've lost because you've alienated them and ultimately you haven't made them feel empowered to make a good decision. Right. So it's like, wow, I don't get any of this. Like if I end a call and somebody says that I'm like failure, like that's not the idea. Right. So make it simple, simplify it as much as possible, make it user-friendly. Like that's what we've sought to do in this whole process so that nobody ever feels overwhelmed by it. It is a lot. And when you sit down with a client, you show them all that, like it is overwhelming to them. Um, so make it as easy as possible. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Start with why Thursday talk again. I messaged about it. I changed mine like four times and then I edited it after I had sent it like twice. So all that to say, be encouraged. It can be a work in progress. <laughs> it doesn't have to be a final version. All right. Thanks for coming, everybody. I will talk to you uh, next week. We are going through something else, but we're out of time. So I'm not going to tell you, wait, hold on. It's not 601 yet. I'll show you really good. Uh, next week we're doing SEO reports. That's perfect. So we will basically do, um, like the small version of this, and then we're going to fill in a real one together and we're going to craft the narrative together. So you guys know the data, that's fine. Data, 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 but we were going to tell a story. And I think that's really important how you phrase things and why, and what you define and all that. All right. See you next week. Thanks guys. Happy Valentine's Thank Day. You. Bye. <laughs>